Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort and creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. I guess summer is passing us by. We are now back to school time. It is. Ah. It's happening. Uh, fall for every fall for y'all means summer here in San Francisco. By the way, it's been stupid hot. It's stupid hot everywhere. Yeah. We are the podcast that talks about creeps from the past to the present. Today, we're talking about creepy history you might not be aware of. It's in a part of the world Sonia and I are really aware of. Sonia is actually from this area. It's in yes. East Bay. It's north east of San Francisco, technically. Yes. Like 30 that miles. Is, yeah, it's like 30 miles from San Francisco. And here's the thing. Literally in my backyard that I grew up and I don't know shit about it so can't wait to learn some history yep some creepy history and in case we didn't drop any f-bombs already (laughs) right now (laughs) we do have a basic Facebook page but we only use that as a place for people to complain about our language we use salty language on this show fuck yeah We're most interactive in our Facebook group. So if you want to join our group, you do have to answer a few questions before you join. But it's Mm -hmm. at What a Creep Podcast group on Facebook. We're on Twitter at Creep Pod because somebody had What a Creep on Twitter for over 10 years and never used it. Creep. We're also on Instagram at What a Creep Podcast. And we have an old tiny email. What a Creep Podcast at gmail.com. That's a great place to send us your comments and suggestions. We love ideas for creeps and also non-creeps. Also, that's a place to go if you would like to get some stickers. Mm-hmm. We would love to send you some stickers. So once again, that's What a Creep Podcast at gmail.com. And Sonia, do you want to tell them about our website? Yes, you can go to whatacreeppodcast.com and it's everything you ever wanted to know about our show, but we're afraid to ask. It's got links to all of our episodes and all of those episodes have show notes. We source everything. We're not just making things up here. Mm -hmm. Uh, We want to give credit where credit is due. Go ahead and check all that out. There's also a link to our merch shop where you can get t-shirts and tote bags and mugs and face masks, all the good things. Somebody posted a picture on Facebook today of their Damn It Max mug. Little did I know that the Damn It Max would become (laughs) quite the seller for us. I think... Everyone has a pet named Max, so (laughs) great. I love it. Um, There's also a link to our Patreon page. Do you want to tell people about that? Yes. Our first few seasons are behind the Patreon wall. We have a few very affordable options. It's P-A-T-R-A-O-N. I want to say thank you to, I hope I'm saying this right, Jerski, Jersky. God damn it. And Michelle, thank you both so much for joining. We also put out two bonus episodes and we also put out a newsletter. Sonia writes a great newsletter and she also puts together, uh, now she adds astrology to it. Mm -hmm. We are in the middle of Mercury in retrograde, right? Or it's just starting? I think it's just starting. And it's already messed with me, y'all. So just be careful for the next three weeks. (laughs) Gird your loins, as they say. Mercury and retrograde is a creep. It is a creep. <laughs> I also want to say thank you to some people, by the way. If you look, if money's tight, we totally understand that. If you could just leave us a few stars wherever you get your sh- shallow D and Anita Swale. And also R- Rachel D. Laney. Rachel has been going through chemo and she listens to us while she's going through chemo. And Oh, Rachel, good luck. Good luck I hope y'all. it's all going well. Yes, absolutely. And you know, we totally appreciate that. That really helps us with the <laughs> assholes. Yeah. That yeah. Hard time. By the way, today's show features assholes from the Democrat Party, Democratic Party. So 
just so you know. All righty. I think that is everything. Are we ready to talk about the show? Or are we talking? Yeah, about let's do it. Episode? Sonia, this is season 17. Damn. Episode one of season 17. Damn. I can't believe it. And they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> So was that like Michael Jackson with Lisa Marie Presley? Yeah, so oh gross. Oy, oy, oy. So gross. That kiss was very... Ooh. Also, the show's going to last forever. <laughs> We're never going to run out of creeps. <laughs> never. It's Sadly. <laughs> Sonia. <clears throat> yes. Are you familiar with the Port Chicago disaster that happened? Sad- <laughs> Sadly, no. Happened July 1944. No, I don't know nothing about it. And it literally happened in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. On Monday, July 17th, 1944, just after 10 p.m., the northern California town of Port Chicago had an explosion of two ships that took the lives of over 320 sailors and injured almost 400 others. For two years, the U.S. Navy had shipped munitions around the clock at the naval base, 24-7, y'all, every single day. That consisted of a segregated outfit. So the entire military, by the way, which was run by Commander-in-Chief, FDR, was segregated. He was asked, Hmm. do you want to integrate before we send people to war? And he said, nah. Nah. He also decided to send Japanese people to internment camps. FDR was fucked up. Yeah. Everything from bullets to bombs weighing hundreds, excuse me, thousands of pounds was brought in and shipped in in 24 hour shifts. White officers were in charge of black officers and recruits, and there was no chance of advancement. What could go wrong here? No one received proper training in handling munitions or were given safety precautions like gloves, glasses, or any kind of gear to protect the crew. In fact, the man who ran the shifts knew there was so much demand for product, the men, excuse me, that ran the shifts, that they didn't worry about safety, that they actually had bets on how fast they could produce product, taking it from the ship out of packages, repackaging them, and then sending them out again. So the white men were betting on their black crew to work faster, and they would receive things like radios or there was a black newspapers you could get a subscription to and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Really cool. The black officers were not only treated poorly on the base, but they also experienced segregation in the communities when they were where they were trained and worked. So it didn't just happen in the South. It also ex- happened in liberal San Francisco area. Yes. This is part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> After the Port Chicago disaster, 50 men refused to continue working under these dangerous conditions and were tried and convicted of treason. Fucked in one way, up. fuck that, yeah. In one way, they helped jumpstart the military civil rights movement, but they have yet to receive proper recognition for what they went through. Maybe our little show can help. Hmm. Let's see. So our sources are, there's the Port Chicago disaster, the Wikipedia page, of course. We have history.com. There's the National World War II Museum. There's an NBC TV special for the 75th anniversary. There's a link there. Contra Costa Historical Society. U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. There's military.com. There's Smithsonian Magazine. There's the book The Port Chicago Disaster by Charles Rivers Editors. And The Port Chicago 50 by Steve Scheinken, which was a YA book and it won a ton of awards. Hmm. What happened was, when America was gearing up for the war, FDR knew that we had sort of like a malicious style of of a military outfit. We didn't really have proper uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. We really didn't have that. We had to build it. And so they were kind of reaching out to people. We want everybody to join. And FDR had said, like I said before, he was asking the leaders for all these departments, should we integrate? And he was specifically told by the Navy, no, we're not prepared for that. It's already going to be tough fighting fascism. America's not ready for it. 
so we can't ask our soldiers to be ready for it. One ism at a time, please. First fascism, then racism. So if if you're African-American and you join the armed forces, and like everybody joins the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, you... But at the time, we didn't really have all the freeways that we do now. So first you were transported by train, you know, for days and days on end. It took forever to get this all together. Yes. And then you were segregated. So you were segregated on different trains at different places. And you were treated differently right from the start. And the people who joined wanted to fight. They did this because they wanted to serve. Because Mm -hmm. they were proud Americans. And it was very disappointing to join and then to be told, oh, you'd be great at mopping. You would be great. Uh, There was a bunch of women, African-American women, that were encouraged to join the wax. And then they joined up and they're like, great, you could be the maid for the women over here. You know, Mm. stuff like that. And this particular, in the Navy... They were sent, they were trained in Flint, around Michigan area, around the lakes, Great Lakes area. There's a lot of training there. And then they were sent to Port Chicago, which was up in the, it's now Concord. They renamed mm-hmm. it. You'll find out why they decided, like, probably change the name of this place. Mm-hmm. But they were sent to Port Chicago. It's a very small town. And it had, it was ability to have two large ships come in and out. And there was, it was segregated. So the black men stayed in one spot and the white men Mm -hmm. stayed in another spot. It was so brand new. It was open just a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So everything was just kind of glued together, just kind of put together. Yeah. And the black men realize they're putting us in munitions and we've had no training to do anything. And they're handling boxes that say things like, warning, explosive, and mm-hmm. they're not taught how to handle them. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? What, what, what could possibly go wrong? And like I said, they're quite often, it's, a, it, it's all white men bossing them around. And of course, there are some white men handling stuff as well. But the black men get the worst shifts. They get the worst bunks. They get the worst of everything. When they go into town, most places won't let them eat. Mm-hmm. In the regular restaurant, it's segregated. They, If they're lucky, they can go through the kitchen and eat there. They're in the East Bay, Sonia. So when they want to hang out, where do you think, if you're black, where would you go to hang out? If you, have, hmm. like, uh, if you, if you just want to go for an evening and go to a restaurant or go dance. What city? Are you asking what city? Yeah, just think of a couple of cities. Oakland? Richmond? Yes. <laughs> yes. And Berkeley. Yeah. And Berkeley. Yes. And those are all, they're all right next to each other. And still, like actually Richmond and Oakland have a very high African American community there. Yes. Yeah. They still do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they did then. And the, out, like, not Danville, not San Ramon. <laughs> no. Those areas are super white and rich. Yes. And parts of San Francisco were just not that very friendly. And. Mm-hmm. That's just how it was. Then that was just like day-to-day life. And it was very frustrating. They're not being trained. They wanted to go overseas. They wanted to fight. And it was just, it was nonstop work. Mm -hmm. And it was very tiring. It was also scary. And there were warnings that this is dangerous. Like this is going to end badly. Yes. You know, people are getting tired. They're working too hard. We need better supervision. And it wasn't listened to. So on the night of July 17th, which was a Monday night at about 10 o'clock, there were two explosions. And there were these two ships, just gigantic Navy ships, if you can just picture that in your head. They flew in the air, twisted in the air, and then landed and then blew apart. That's how much ammunition was in them. Just thousands of pounds. That is scary. It's fucking scary. And it just, they're made of steel and they just all just blew apart. It killed 320 sailors. Jesus. Every single, and sailors and civilians, everybody that was anywhere near it. 
Right. The ships were decimated. There was very little left. And then there was just all the people around the docks. The docks were decimated. They could hear it up to San Francisco. Yes. They could hear it to Santa Rosa. They could feel it up to Nevada. They could feel it down to San Jose. Wow. So it's 10 o'clock at night, and the word goes out. Anybody, you know, there was, like, there was one guy that was at a movie theater, and everybody fell to the movie theater in Berkeley. And they're like, okay, if you work for Port Chicago, you got you to gotta show up right now. They need you. One guy was on the toilet, flew off the toilet. Oh, my God. the wall, and then flew out, flew back again. And he had, he had glass on his back, and he didn't Jesus. do it because they spent three days cleaning up. Wow. All of the buildings were destroyed. And the worst part was only 51 bodies were recovered. All of oh. the all bodies yeah, yeah. were just blown apart. Jesus. And there were men that were on. There was one man that went to San Diego. His wife was just given birth. He had to come back. All of his friends were dead. Everybody's gone. Then they spend three days having to clean up and once that is again so awful black men had to put on waders and go out in the water and clean up right they get the worst job right and the white officers got to go out in the field and stuff but still everybody was traumatized because it, it, if you can imagine yeah it well i'm really... sure they like knew a lot of these people yeah for and... one thing and it's fucked up it's super fucked up this is one of the worst homeland disasters ever um, since Pearl Harbor. It was 15% of the total loss of African Americans in the war. Jeez. Wow. In just one fell swoop. So they get a couple of days and one man was in the hospital. He was in the hospital for four days and then he got out of the hospital. And then once they cleaned up, they went to, um, so they go to Vallejo after this. And there's another port there. Mm -hmm. The Navy's kind of separating everybody again, of course, segregating everyone again. So you have your yes. white guys and your black, your black troops and everybody, you know, the white troop members, everybody was saying we're freaked out. And it's like every time somebody like a, a car truck, you know, backs up that makes that now loud noise, yeah. you hear a chair scraping across the floor, just any loud noise. They're all shaking. They're yeah. all up, all of them. And you would think that with what happened and everything that they've been through, that you would think they would be bonded, that segregation wouldn't matter. It would be like, we're in this together. Like, let's get, it's like, no, oh, no, no, it doesn't Sonia. work. It, it, it doesn't work that way. No. So they were all sent to Vallejo because they had all cleaned this up now. So that's just like how, not that far away. Mm-hmm. So they're all sent to Vallejo. So there's, the troops are then segregated again. And once again, crappy quarters and the nicer quarters. Yes. And then the white servicemen that were there said, we need 30 days rest because we're freaked out. We're tired. We've been, you know, out there picking up bodies of our friends. Mm -hmm. Our families are upset. And the U.S. government said, yeah, you're right. 30 days. The black officers said, we'd like to take 30 days as well. Let's all just take 30 days. And they said, no. Of course. They could not. Fucking, <laughs> fucking trash. They're trash. <laughs> so there was a few weeks later, there was, a, there was an investigation. To this day, nobody can tell what actually happened. There's no evidence. Everything blew up. Yeah. I don't right. know how to explain it to you. Just like this, these ships flew in the air, twirled around, and then burst apart. Like they could see, there were, there were a couple of planes that flew over, and they could see the, the flames up really high and metal flying like a mile in, in the sky. Like it's Jesus. just, there's just, there's no way. And so they had a lot of, military come in and they had a few black men that were servicemen that they interviewed five out of 125 the rest were white and it was decided that it must have been the black 
men's fault because they're just not as smart as the white men and they just work too fast and they were being they were betting on working too fast and they were just racing each other and that's what did it so fucked up it's so fucked up these fucking creeps (sighs) the families of the people who died and that could be and there were many that were just never identified correct because some people that sign up for the war, you know, some of these men were 17, 16, 17. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of them were just kids. It was like they wanted to serve, but some of them was like their one chance to kind of break out of poverty or break away. Right. Um, but those that could be identified, their families, you know, you're given a flag, you're given this, you know, and you're supposed to be given a certain amount of money for your service. Mm-hmm. They were supposed to be given $5,000 each. There was a... Mississippi senator who said five grand they're Negroes <gasps> they got two grand <laughs> this, he was uh, a <laughs> so fucked up okay so that's just I, I, I can't even imagine the mindset of that like I just I can't wrap my head around that kind of thinking what the fuck? Right. Like, how? I, mm, bah, mm, okay. Yeah. Their lives aren't as important. Their lives don't right. matter as much. It's not as much of a loss. That kind of thing. That kind of thinking. It's, it's super fucked up. All righty then. So the men that lived and were still serving did not want to go back to this duty. They were like, we'll do anything else. Just not munitions. Right. We yeah, well, serve. first of yeah, first of all, it was clearly not safe. They clearly didn't learn any fucking lessons. And also, the post-traumatic stress, which I'm sure wasn't a thing talked about at the time, of Maybe doing like, a yeah. yeah, doing that kind of job. It's like, no, like I don't <laughs> you don't want to do that. It would be like like if you worked at a bank now and the bank got robbed and people were killed or whatever, maybe you wouldn't want to work at the bank anymore. You right. know, like it's fucked up. Of course they don't want to go back and do that job. Right. Hell no. Hell to the no. So there's 250 of them that line up that, you know, you have to line up and then you march hut to hut to, right? And yeah. you're going to go to show up for your gig you know we're gonna go to this munitions plant and there's a guy named smalls and he sort of is the leader who's like this is fucked up i'm not doing it they shouldn't be treating us this way this is like being on a plantation it's like being Mm -hmm. you know on a chain gang or something this is shit and what happens is so they they're they're marching and then at one point they're supposed to turn left and then go into the plant and start working and instead, they all turn right. And so they're all ordered, you know, back to their barracks. And then they're all ordered to be on this boat. And basically, a white superior comes in and says, if you don't go back to work, this is mutiny. He, and he takes, all right, he takes them out to a baseball field, neutral territory. And mm-hmm. he says, let me tell you this. If you don't follow orders, that is mutiny. And the punishment for mutiny is death squad, firing squad. So you either go back to work or you will be tried, you'll be convicted, and you'll be shot. And I don't want to hear it. So fucked up. So fucked up. 200 men decided to go back because they were like, I got to do it. I can't. Yeah, they're scared. Terrified either way. Like that you can't win. It's a racist system. You know, some of them, their, their families depend on that check coming in. Yeah. You know. How awful. So they still got demerits or whatever you want to call that for right. participating, you know, for one day or two day or whatever it was. But they went back. But then there were 50 that refused. That's right, right Max. Max like, yeah, we'll, I'll give them pats and licks and give them <laughs> comfort. Max wants to knock these other guys down and break their bones. Yeah. They go 
And then so they're then they're sent to back to the ship and it's like they're they're being punished. So then there's going to be this big trial and the government decides we're going to have this trial at Treasure Island in San Francisco and we're going to invite all these reporters to come so they can see that we're not being racist, that this is being this is a fair trial. Right. And. And um, Thurgood Marshall, who would later on be the first African-American Supreme Court justice in America, mm-hmm. was working for the NAA- um, NAACP and working on a lot of cases around the country where there's so many cases of racism, you know, just in general, but especially yeah. in the armed forces of people yes. being, we talked about Jackie Robinson last week. So he came out to help with this trial. And these men were trying to say, like, we weren't. We weren't threatening anybody's life. We weren't threatening any major right. leader's life or, or America's safety. We weren't selling secrets to the enemy. We weren't doing anything. We were trying just to protect our and other people's lives because people were killed. Right. Civilians were killed. Like we want to just make it safe. And we were also subjected to racism and segregation. Thurgood Marshall tried to help and... Even, it was all in the papers. Everything was out there. They were convicted. Um, every single one. And they were sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. Not death. Because our president at the time, FDR, consulted his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. And she was really hooked in with the African-American community and said, yeah, that's no, you can't do that. That was her helping. Yeah. Thanks for the help, Eleanor. <laughs> really, really, really great was the, was the hard labor just making them do the job that they wanted them to do in the first place? No, they did get sent to like a prison type place. And, it, and but that, they only had to serve a couple of years and then they were let go. I mean, and Eleanor Roosevelt did work behind the scenes to get that taken care of. It's so fucked up, though. But it's though. super fucked up. So the 200 men that did, like, they, they protested, like, that one day, and then they went back. You know, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't get all the things they should have gotten. Like, when they got out of the war, they didn't. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so many you know, benefits that you get as a veteran, veteran that they didn't get. And the 50 men that obviously were convicted didn't get that either. And it was right. always this blight on their record. And for a lot of these men, it got forgotten about. Like, nobody talked uh-huh. about it. Nobody, Bay Area, they don't talk about it. Like, Seriously, nobody... I have never heard this story before. Right. It's not in the history I, I, books. It's not Yeah, it's not common history there. Like, I went to school. I went to DVC for a while. Yeah. Uh, junior college in the area. Nobody talked about it. I grew up here. I lived here. I Or I still live here. Never heard this before. Right. Um, so they're, so these men, they have this blight on their record and it's every once in a while, somebody comes along and the idea is thrown out, especially with the civil rights movement in the sixties. Why don't we have a pardon? And for mm-hmm. the men who are even willing to talk about it publicly, cause they're trying to get jobs and live their lives. Yeah. Have a business, get a business loan, try to get a business loan when you have this kind of thing on your record, right. Or do anything. Right. You know, have kids, fall in love, just do things that other people do. And have yeah. this PTSD, by the way, of like all this other crap you've been through. So awful. That. But a lot of them said, I don't want a pardon because I didn't do anything wrong. Uh-huh. And that's the problem with a pardon is like you have to admit you've done something wrong. And this is like another thing, like when we when people <laughs> ask for pardons, it's like. You're admitting you're doing something wrong when you're asking for a pardon. Yes. And that's why these men were like, no, I don't want one. Now, one of them did get one from Bill Clinton before he died. And he was just like, fuck it. You know, I'm I'm going to die soon. Let's just do this. Yeah. But no, there's still every few years, there's this effort. And there was at the 75th anniversary a couple of years ago to... You know, change the history books. And the military produces this beautiful video. The Navy itself is like, yeah, this isn't right. This is a huge miscarriage uh-uh. of justice. This is not who we represent now. This is not right. who we are. This is a way of making things right and saving their names. What they did is they took that area 
and it's now a part of the parks system. Mm -hmm. They've never built on top of it. They didn't change anything about it. So what's left of the docks from that day is still there. What's left of the ships, everything. And they put the names of all the men that they did find, which was 51, and they have their names on a plaque that's out there. And every year on July 17th, the families come out and they sell, you know, celebrate. They, they, they memorialize yeah. what's happening. But, you know, it was around, I'd say, maybe the 50th anniversary that some of them were just so old and were just like, right, come on. You know, we just want justice. We just, that's when they started telling their story. So that's where right. maybe one of the reasons why we didn't hear about it. It wasn't until the 1990s that a bunch of them were like, this is just, right. this is going to get swept under the rug and no one will ever know unless we really talk about it. And so that's- where's the, where's their documentary series? There's been, you know, if you go around YouTube, you'll find some really interesting videos. There's a few books that are out there. There's something that's coming out next month. Let me look it up. Which is what I found in Smithsonian, which is what we wanted to do. It's called Half American. And it's by Matthew Delmont. And they're, um, he was in Smithsonian Magazine. Which, um, mm-hmm. And it's an excerpt. And it's all about p- basically African Americans serving in the military. Ooh, okay, okay. Yeah, so this is just one of the stories that's in there. But it, it's, uh, yeah, it, there's there's so many stories like this. And... You know, we want to put a a rosy image on things, but I think about this, like my uncle, my brother Joe served in the Navy Mm -hmm. for a long time, but um, my father's uncle, Uncle Joe, was in Oakland during World War II. He was there around this time. And I wonder, I think he served in Oakland. I don't think he was, but I wonder like, Mm -hmm. would he have been one of the good guys or would he have been one of the racist assholes that... My grandfather also. Yeah. Like served in the military at this time and i'm like he would have been one of the assholes (laughs) i know this about my grandfather like yeah like it's the way you're raised and the way you're taught yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the families they the you know and and some of the you know a lot of times in these military families their sons and grandsons and granddaughters they join the military and they're trying to keep the story alive and so that's that's our creepy history this week. It's the Port Chicago disaster. Good job, my friend. I love our creepy history yeah. series. I I think it's so interesting. Yeah. And you did a really good job. Thank you. This, I feel like I learned a lot. And like I said, I literally live here. Yeah. And I've never heard this. So I don't know. Maybe other listeners are going to be like, are you an idiot? Like, it's everywhere in the Bay Area. But I don't think it is. No, no. I lived in Danville, which is, I mean, which is not that far away from this. Like I said, I went to DBC. That's Diablo Valley College. Yes. And it's right in that neighborhood. And I didn't have one instructor tell me about this. No one ever, Mm -mm. nothing. You know what? History classes, at least when we were in high school and college like i feel like they almost always ended like at world war ii same we know like no vietnam no we never got past world war ii like every class like i was like i know all this stuff like i don't know and like they never taught anything after never and i'm like we're we're not communism bad (laughs) (laughs) also i'm like we're not that old. Right. Like, we're not, like, so old where they're like, maybe Vietnam hadn't even happened yet. No, it had definitely happened. Like, we did not talk about Vietnam, Watergate, like, things, you know, Reaganomics and all that. Like, none of that shit was covered in school ever. Right. Like, I, ugh, you did a really good job. Should we take a break and then we can come back and talk about our non-creep? I'm very curious who the non-creep is. So, yeah, let's take a quick break and get into okay. it. Okay. Do you know who Representative George Miller is? No. Okay. He served as the U.S. Representative for California from 75 to 2015. He uh, was the 
representative who petitioned to clear the names of the sailors oh, from the thank God you did this Good. from the Port Chicago disaster. Um, he was unable to like succeed in a lot of this. He kept passing stuff. It didn't happen, but eventually. Uh, one of the 50 mutineers, Freddie Meeks, yes. uh, George Miller got him uh, pardoned. Like, that was his thing. And I thought this was very interesting. So George Miller, he was born in Richmond. Uh, his dad, George Miller Jr., was the leader of the liberal wing of the California Democratic Party at the time. Uh, this George Miller, the one we're talking about, graduated from DVC. Hey! <laughs> and he went to San Francisco State University. My sister's alma mater. Yes. He uh, also went to the University of California Davis Law School. He has a Juris Doctor, and he served as a legislative assistant to then California State Senate Majority Leader George Moscone, who we've mm -hmm. talked about in some of our other episodes. Um, and George Miller had the reputation they used to call him the liberal lion and he has one of the most liberal voting records in the house he um they uh, said not like teddy teddy um, excuse me teddy kennedy ted kennedy, what do they liberal lion oh well i guess maybe have, george mill george, george miller, miller wasn't drown any women did he <laughs> no not that i'm aware of i didn't see anything about that and i will i will say like i I hesitate to even put a politician that is an AOC in a non-creep category because yeah. inevitably someone might come back to me and be like, well, he did this one thing. This is probably true, but this is – here's some good things. So um, he got that pardon for Freddie Meeks, which – and here's a few other like non-creepy things he did. So um, he walked out of the House chamber during President Ford's State of the Union address when he requested military aid for South Vietnam. He's always been like super, super liberal, this guy. He, wow. they, they would say – like he was really, really good friends with Nancy Pelosi. I, actually, I should say he's still alive, so he probably still <laughs> is. Um, they used to fly – because she's San Francisco and he was East Bay, so they used to fly back and forth together a lot. And he had her ear. And in fact, she will say, like, he mentored her a lot. And so she learned a lot from him. Um, George Miller was a member of the National Resource Committee, and he is the one who pushed – to preserve public lands, so uh, things like Death Valley National Park and the Joshua Tree National Park mm -hmm. are thanks to George Miller. Wow. Um, he was a very outspoken critic of the apparel industry's record on uh, worker safety, right which on. we talked about in the, some of our in our some of our episodes. He fought for a higher minimum wage. He overhauled the student loan program. Uh, he won a major expansion of the federal food program for poor mothers and children. Um, he was instrumental in getting the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act passed, which obviously hits me in a soft spot. Like, this is something that my son benefits from now, even now. Um, he was the sponsor of the Protecting Students from Sexual and Violent Predators Act, and that was a bill that required school districts to run background checks, criminal Imagine background checks. Imagine that. Maybe you don't want a fucking child molester or a murderer teaching your children. What? Like, by the way, <laughs> that was 2013. 2013. It wasn't even that long ago. Uh, he's also been a big supporter of Native American gaming, which is a big thing here in, in California. Key architect of the Affordable Care Act. Nice. Um, one of the first to back Barack Obama when he ran for president. Um, when he was serving, dude was known as like a workhorse. Like he read eight newspapers a day back when newspapers right. were a thing. He read eight newspapers a day and he used to prepare for like legislative combat he would call it like legislative combat and he said he would he treated it like he was going to do an oral argument before the supreme court like he read everything he was like fully prepared 
you hear stories now about people they don't even read the fucking bills they don't even read the bills and here's like this is someone who definitely was doing that they and read like mean lit- tweets and get upset yeah yeah exactly you know they oh, fuck ted cruz <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> so um he retired uh in 2015 he was in congress for like 40 years um he's married to his high school sweetheart Aww. um he moved back to his like home in Martinez. That's like not far from right. where I am. Um, he has like a couple children. He's got like six grandchildren. I mean, is any politician perfect? No, but he did a lot of awesome shit. Right. So I felt like he was a, a good one to call out. No, that was excellent. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah. I, I guess that a lot of people really tried. It's, it's, and yeah. He, yeah, he in particular really, really tried. It's 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 just such a struggle to get people yeah. to pay attention to this. And it's it's so clouded and it takes a lot of explanation and and yeah. It, yeah. Well, that's our show this week, our seventeenth season. How exciting is that? What? So good. I think maybe for our next episode we should do one of our uh round, round table. Yeah, one of our roundups. That would be good. A quartet of creeps, maybe? Yes. A gaggle. A murder of creeps. I love that. <laughs> if you like the sound of our voices, and why the hell wouldn't you? We also cover a show, cover a show, excuse me. We have a show about movies, and it's called Dorking Out. Sonia, what are we going to be dorking out about next? We're going back to school. We're going to talk about 1986s. We've done a lot of 86, so we'll try to mix it up, but not this time because yeah, we're going to go back. We're going back to school. It's Rodney Dangerfield's comedy. It's got him, uh, Robert Downey Jr. in one of his early roles, William Boingo, Zabka. Boingo. Boingo, Boingo's in there. Kurt Vonnegut's in there. Screw like, you, Vonnegut. I got a D. <laughs> I am very curious to rewatch this one. I haven't seen it in a while, but I definitely liked it back in the day. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's streaming right now on HBO Max. So if you have HBO Max and you want to do your homework before the show, you should watch it. Please follow us on all the social media things. Once again, send us your ideas for creeps and non-creeps in those places, and we do love it when you use the Annie Potts gift we you. We got one from the Ghostbusters movie, (laughs) the first one. I don't think she's in the second one, is she? Or she, she is. Gone in the second one? No, no. She's she's like putting the moves on Lewis. Oh no! Yeah, it's so weird. The second one's not. Some people love the second one. I do not. I had such a crush on Egon. Same, right? Still do. R.I.P. Mm Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. I got all distracted there. <laughs> Yo, hey, Harold Ramis is one of the writers of Back to School. Is he really? Yep. Wow. There you, know, you supposedly go. Supposedly he could do a crossword puzzle like the New York Times, like the Saturday one that's like super, super hard. Yeah. He could do it in like 10 minutes or something. This like does that. not surprise me at all. This just makes him even hotter to me. <sighs> crossword puzzle <laughs> and pen. <laughs> oh. <Okay. laughs> I got to fan myself. Okay. Sonia, where can they find you? You can find me at thesoniashow.com and the Sonia Show on Twitter and Instagram and the TikTok. Where can people find you, Margo? You can find me at brooklynfitchick.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at brooklynfitchick. And on TikTok, I am at Margo Donahue. Thanks again, once again, all of y'all for listening. We really appreciate it. Stay safe. And for God's sakes, don't be a creep. Be a creep. Thank you for listening to us talk about creeps. You can follow us at What a Creep Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But don't follow us too closely. You can email us your creepy stories at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. But please keep your dick pics to yourself. 